So following up on Dave's summary of my opening remark, which is welcome and thank you for coming, uh, I will say uh, for those of you that haven't met me, I am Dan Andreessen and I'm the one that approved your account when you applied for it. <laughs> and and uh, at any rate, it's been fun to see everybody applying with lots of different uh, domains and sciences and research and education that's going on. Um, and the areas that, in which BioCAD is being applied have just been expanding like crazy, which is great. So uh, thanks, have fun, ask questions, and uh, in the event that uh, we go too fast, slow us down, and if we aren't going fast enough, tell us, and we'll make sure we put more content in next time. And so yeah, give us some feedback and let us know how we're doing. And also feel free to email me or uh, BioCAD at CS if you've got some questions, comments, suggestions. Um, you know, what are we doing well at? What are we doing poorly at? How can we help? And go from there. So thanks for coming. Okay, so I'm Dave Turner. I'm the application scientist for the group. And just to introduce some of the other people involved, uh, we have Adam Tigert and Kyle Hudson here, who are sysadmins for BioCat. And we have Brandon Dunn here. He's going to talk about uh, Git repository in a little bit, using that as a, a revision control system. Uh, our agenda for today is to take the first hour and kind of do some advanced uh, talks about a little bit about modules and then about the uh, uh, Slurm scheduler. Uh, I'll also talk about uh, a little bit more about using Ganglia to look at your jobs as they run, uh, which allows you to look at the code in different ways than what KSTAT will allow you to do. The, uh, uh, then we'll have an overview of Git, and about an hour in, as Dan said, we have to give up half of our room, so we'll take a few minute break and condense down to one half of the room. The second hour, I'll be talking about parallel computing and kind of give you an overview of what parallel computing is, and uh, just uh, to give you a flavor so that when you look at a program and see an MPI statement in there, you know what it is. Um, I'll then lead that into some performance stuff. You'll be mainly, if you're using multi-processor uh, codes, you may not be programming them, but you may be using them. So you may have to know uh, performance-related issues, and I'll go into some of uh, that at the end and then lead into uh, some software installation. If you have to install your own software, how do you go about doing that? So we're gonna start out with talking about modules a little bit more, just to uh, kind of get everyone on the same page again. Uh, I'm gonna cover a little bit of what I did on Monday. Um, with our conversion over to CentOS uh, and using the Slurm, uh, scheduler, we're also using modules. So if you're going to use Intel compilers, for example, you need to actually load those modules. Uh, so one of the common tool chains, chains to use is this IOMKL. Uh, I actually have a module load of this in my bash RC file uh, so that each time I log in, I get this tool chain. And so if you do a module load of IOMKL, that loads the Intel compilers, so ICC and IFORT. It also loads OpenMPI compiled for uh, the Intel compilers or compiled with the Intel compilers. And it loads the Intel math kernel library, which includes BLOS libraries, uh, for, uh, fast Fourier transforms, uh, LOPAC stuff. 
So this is an entire tool chain that you can use to build your codes. The other main one here is this FOSS, the free open source software. This is the same thing, but it's the GNU compilers. Along with the GNU compilers, instead of the math kernel library, you have the free uh, equivalents, which are uh, open BLOS for your BLOS and LAPAC and FFTW, and then ScalaPack has your uh, multiprocessor LAPAC stuff in it. This also includes a version of OpenMPI, but this is compiled with uh, the uh, GNU compilers. So one thing, uh, so typically if you're gonna do a build, you'll either want an Intel build or a GNU build. So you would typically load one of these or the other. Um, if you want to have access to both at the same time, uh, you can pick and choose various ones. Like uh, since I have to do uh, Intel builds and GNU builds in the same day, what I could do is I could load the whole IOMKL tool chain, and then I can't really go and load FOSS because if I did that, the OpenMPI would conflict. There's OpenMPI in both those, so uh, I couldn't just do a module load of FOSS. If I did that, it would tell me that it's putting the GNU version of OpenMPI in there instead of the Intel version. So what I could do is pick and choose some of the GNU stuff, like just doing a module load of GCC to get the compilers, for example. So you can set it up so that everything is available on both sides, except for where there's a, co a conflict like the uh, OpenMPI, for example. One of the nice things about modules also is that you can pick and choose the uh, uh, version. Uh, so for if you do a module avail, and grip for ICC, there's many different versions of ICC. So if your code for whatever reason doesn't build with the newest version, you can go back and look at older versions. Let's see, I'm, I'm missing my bottom stuff. How do I switch back? Windows person? Yeah, I'm not able to switch back. So what key did you hit? The Windows key. The Windows key. I don't have one of those on my Mac, so I'm unfamiliar with it. Yeah, okay, so let's see. What, no, yeah. Got it. So again, yeah, are we recording? So I have the IOMKL in there. So again, if I just did a module load of FOSS, okay, there's a place I can't read the screen. It would again load it, but again, it's telling me that it can't, uh, it's already found a conflict. So it, it did go back and replaced uh, the ICC version of OpenMPI with the GNU build. So again, that's what I just went over. So again, if I wanted both, I could do the IOMKL and just load in the uh, GCC, for example, and get uh, both, but uh, choose the OpenMPI that I want. So here I'm doing a module available, avail and gripping for ICC. And again, you can see that if you need older versions of the Intel compiler, um, you can go back to 17.1. 17 the 18.1, 18 is 2018.0 is the current, but 2017.1. So you can go back a year, and the same with GCC, you can go back uh, to previous versions. Some codes are picky about that, uh, so it all depends. The default ones are the newest ones, but that's nice thing about modules is that you can go back uh, to previous versions if your code is, is getting picky about something.
Okay, some of the other things with modules. Again, we talked about MPI, which is the message passing interface. Open MPI is the one that we support. Uh, it's a common free one. Um, there's another one based on MPICH out of Argonne National Lab, or this is a fork of that MVA pitch that's uh, developed at Ohio State University. Uh, this works in the same way. You have your same MPICC and MPI fork uh, compilers, uh, and then your MPI run statement. But if you want to use MVA pitch two instead of uh, the open MPI stuff, all you have to do is a module load of G GMVA pitch that sets up all your paths for you. Then you just use MPICC to compile and MPI run to run stuff. So that's the nice thing about these modules is that it sets up all your paths to the binaries and to the libraries as well. So switching to a different version of uh, open MPI or MVA pitch is easy. The other thing I'll mention here is uh, CUDA. So if you're going to use GPUs, if you have to compile a code to use GPUs, uh, then you need the CUDA library to compile for the NVIDIA graphics processors. Uh, so you, if you're going to do that, you can do a module load of CUDA. Uh, I'm not sure what GCC CUDA versus CUDA, Adam. CUDA is just the it, 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 CUDA is just NVIDIA stuff. In this case, GCC CUDA also loads up the GCC compilers and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, in general, if you're going to uh, deal with uh, compiling CUDA, it can get tricky because CUDA is a little picky on the version numbers. We've run into one problem where we're running CUDA 9.0 and the code needed 9.1 which needs different licenses actually, driver licenses and stuff. But it can also be picky on what compiler you use. So you start by doing a module load of CUDA and that will uh, should load the compilers uh, that it needs. And if you run into trouble with these tool chains, the easiest thing to do is send us email and start working with Adam. He's done a good job of uh, of working with these tool chains uh, to get the right versions or several options for versions of compilers with CUDA that he's needed to compile some of the packages that we already have installed as modules. But that doesn't mean that a new software package won't require something else. So again, uh, the modules are made to make it easy but getting the right version numbers to uh, compile given codes, uh, you may have to work a little at it. And the best thing to do is to ask us for help. Okay, I think that's all I wanna talk about modules. Uh, I guess the other thing is, uh, if you're having trouble compiling, when you send us a message, the first thing you should do is a module list. That gives us a complete list of everything that's in your, uh, all the modules you have loaded and all the dependencies that they loaded. And this can help us to uh, decipher what exactly is, is going on. Okay, any questions about modules? Okay, most of the stuff is uh, things that we went over on Monday. I will go over installing software some more at the end of this. Okay, I'm going to go on to uh, some advanced Slurm. Okay, so we covered the basics on Monday of how to use Slurm. Instead of uh, SGE, we have the Slurm scheduler. Uh, fairly simple uh, way of converting from SGE script to Slurm is the kstat.convert Perl script that I wrote up that automatically converts most everything over. And uh, we've pointed you to some of the documentations on using the basics. So 
I want to start in with some of the more advanced topics here. And the first one is if you're asking for uh, additional resources, uh, you can use the minus, minus G res uh, parameter. And what I mean by advanced resources are two things here. First of all, your communication fabric, and then second of all, your GPUs. So let's start in on the communication fabric. If you're running multi-core stuff on a given node, you don't need to worry about that. That's within a node. This is talking uh, between nodes. Uh, the communications fabric between our nodes, on the ELVs we have what's called QDR InfiniBand. Uh, that's 40 gig, but some of that is, uh, is, is essentially check bits. You only, I can only measure about 26 gigabits per second. And uh, the same is true on the moles. Uh, we're getting about 26 gigabits per second and about a one and a half microsecond latency. So that's very good. On the heroes and dwarves, uh, that's using what's called Rocky, uh, RDMA over converged ethernet, ROCE. Uh, that uses the same InfiniBand software, but it's over ethernet. And on those two systems, we get about 40 gigabits per second. Although we're seeing some problems if you're using multiple streams out of those. So those are the two choices. If you're doing multi-node stuff that's embarrassingly parallel, so you essentially are not worried about the communication because you're doing so little communication that it's not really taking any time, um, then you don't really need to request a specific fabric. Uh, you can just run it on more cores, you get that much speed up, that's great. Uh, if you are trying to do multi-node stuff uh, that does require significant bandwidth, then you need to uh, request a given fabric and request it in the correct way. So with GRES, what this allows you to do is, for example, right here, in your SBAC script, you can put minus minus GRES equals fabric colon IB for InfiniBand colon one. What this is asking for is only the InfiniBand network. The one means at least one gigabit per second. So all you're really asking for is I want InfiniBand. This is gonna limit you to just the elves or the moles, because those are the ones with InfiniBand on. If you're doing something that's gonna stress InfiniBand out, I would put 40 instead of one. This is not so important on the elves because all of them will be up to that standard. On the moles, we have some problem with cabling. So some of the, the moles are limited to about 20 gigabits and less. So if you're running on the moles, I would definitely put 40 there. So fabric colon IB colon 40. Yeah, so those are some technical issues. The moles are new. We're still trying to work some of those things out. If you're on the heroes or dwarves, you do something similar. You put minus minus G res equals fabric colon Rocky colon, and then one is good enough uh, because that's saying use Rocky. If you want to put 40 there, that's fine too. All of them can do at least the 40 gigabits. Uh, if, you're, if you're really stressing out the network, this is something you should probably be in touch with me about because again, depending on how you run the code, the Rocky is not working like it should. And that's more of a problem with Rocky rather than us. So I'm working with Mellanox, one of the vendors, while well, I was, they stopped talking to me now. So anyway, uh, so that's how you request a given network fabric. There's one other thing that you should do, again, if you're doing something that's multi-node, you should put in there minus minus switches equals one. Um, by putting switches equals one, that will 
tell Slurm to, to schedule your job to be on the same switch. Um, if you have it on your job on multiple switches, there can be a bottleneck between the switches. So if you're running multi-node jobs that are gonna stress out the network, you should put that minus minus switches equals one. And let me uh, show you an example of this. So this is my NetPipe benchmark, job name, output there with the percent J for the job number, requesting uh, 40 minutes, four gigs. Again, this is minus minus mem equals, so that's total memory per node, rather than specifying memory per core. I'm asking for a constraint of the elves. So this is another thing. I just want to test this out on the elves, so I'm putting a constraint in of the elves. I'm asking for two nodes, 16 tasks or cores per node. So I'm asking for the entire elf. This is, I have priority under the reserve, so I'm asking for that partition. So since I'm testing out InfiniBand, I put fabric GRES equals fabric IB40 and switches equals one. So that's how I'm requesting things to get everything right. And then way down here, I do my MPI run commands. I'm asking for two nodes. And here's the actual application and options. OK. So the other thing is GPUs. If you're asking for GPUs, it's pretty simple. Minus minus G res equals GPU colon, and then the number of GPUs you're requesting. Some codes like NAMD will grab every GPU that's available. Slurm is very good in this, in that if you ask for one GPU, that's the only thing your code will see is the environment with that, even if there's two GPUs. Uh, on the node. KSTAT minus G will show you the nodes that have GPUs on and the codes that are in the queue waiting for GPUs. So um, the font size is wrapping these, but uh, Dwarf 22 has 32 cores plus two GPUs. And right now, Jeff Comer is running a two GPU job. He actually owns this, a lot of the GPU nodes. We have, uh, what, five GPU nodes that have dual GPUs and they're owned by him. And then we have two single GPU dwarves that are open. So if you need to use GPUs, you're gonna have to email us and let me know and I can put you on the list that's approved for using GPUs. Okay, so parallel jobs. So again, a lot of this uh, uh, for jobs within a given node, uh, you basically have to, so the way I recommend uh, asking for cores is always if you're even if you're on one node, I would recommend uh, specifying minus minus nodes equals one, and then minus minus n tasks per node equals, and the number of cores that you want. Uh, there are other ways of doing this. That's, I think, the broadest uh, and clearest. If you're asking for multiple node uh, jobs, you can control how they're spread. You can do minus minus uh, let's see the, that, oh, this upper one here, minus minus nodes equals six will give you six nodes, and then a minus minus n tasks per node equals four will give you four tasks on each of those six nodes for 24 cores total. Um, you can also just ask for 40 tasks. If you do this, it'll give you 40 tasks on uh, just spread across whatever nodes it feels like it wants to put. 
So you should only use this if your code is embarrassingly parallel. It does mean that it'll schedule a little faster because it provides the most flexibility to the scheduler. Okay, requesting memory for multi-node jobs. Again, uh, you can either request memory on a per core basis or a per node basis. Uh, getting email sent to you. The most common thing is to set the mail type to all. This does begin, end, and fail, as well as requeue. If you want to control that more finely, if you say you just want to be emailed when your job begins, you can put mail type equals begin, or you can separate things with commas, I believe. Begin, comma, end, for example. Job naming, uh, I think this shows the short version minus capital J and job name, you can also do minus minus, is it just job name, I think? That's what I use. I guess I can look back at my scripts, I use it. Yeah. And the normal for, you can control where your standard out and standard error go uh, separately if you want. I think it's always better to put them in the same place and that's done automatically. Under SG, uh, it divided those, but under Slurm, it, it combines those automatically. And your normal output, if you don't specify anything, will be Slurm dash, then the job ID number dot out. So uh, I always like to customize that. So I use the minus minus output equals, and I like the SGE style, so I do output equals and then the application name netpipe dot o and then percent j for the job number. That gets me to where SGE did before. It still tacks on the job number, but you can put in there whatever you want. The percent j is useful in that that puts the job number in. Percent x uses the job name. So if you wanted to do something like output equals percent x dot O percent J, that would get you similar to what SGE did. Running in the current working directory, you used to have to specify that with SGE, you don't with Slurm, Slurm does that automatically. If you want to run on a specific type of machine, again, you use the constraint command. So uh, it's best if you just put in how much memory, how many cores, and that kind of stuff that you want to run on and let the scheduler put you in the right place. If you do for some reason want to put it onto a certain class of machines, the constraint is how you do it. If you want to aim at multiple classes like heroes and dwarves, I haven't tested this out extensively, but I think you put a pipe as an or. So you'd constraint equals dwarves pipe heroes. Other things to use constraints for is uh, kind of the, the class of the processor. So AVX, uh, some codes are, if you compile them uh, in a given way, will require AVX or AVX2. AVX uh, would preclude them from running on our mages. For example, they're just too old, they don't support AVX. AVX2 would, would preclude you from running on the mages and the elves. If your code isn't compiled with this, don't worry too much about it, so. Uh, Slurm environment variables. So if you're, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, array jobs uh, where we're gonna need some Slurm environment variables. Uh, these you use in inside of your sbatch script, and I'll show you a few examples. But for most anything in, in your sbatch script, there's an environment variable like Slurm job node list. Uh, for example, there's one for job name, there's one for the number of nodes, number of processes, job partition, 
So you can just look through this when you're writing your script up and get a full list of uh, which ones are available. And you can see it's quite extensive. Uh, let me go through a few more things and then I'll show you some examples. So this is, again, basically running from an SBatch script uh, that we went over on, with, on Monday. This does so a, an example of requesting the fabric, although that's commented out with an extra pound sign. Okay, so let me go back and show the uh, example again of uh, a few environment variables. So this is my NetPipe script, uh, submission script again. And uh, I do some processing. So with NetPipe, I'm asking for the complete node because I'm doing performance tests, I don't want anyone else using the network. So I'm asking for the full node, but in times I only want one processor on each node. Um, so I have to process the uh, node list and cut it down to where I'm just using, uh, I'm requesting one core on each rather than all of them. So I'm using the Slurm job node list as one of my environment variables there. And then I think I'm also using nprox, let's see. Yeah, so nprox down here, I'm just shortening it. Slurm n tests is the number of tasks that I'm using. So since I'm asking for two nodes, 16 cores per node, the n tasks would be 32 in this case. So there's a couple examples of what I mean by an environment variable for Slurm and we'll, Look, we'll see a little bit more of that when I talk about array jobs. Okay, file access. So in general, you're going to uh, a lot of times be running off of your home directory. Your home directory is limited to one terabyte of disk space. For a lot of users, that's an enormous amount. For other users, that's not nearly enough. The bioinformatics people, I see one at the end here, we'll say that's very little amount. Uh, they sometimes deal with files that are 100 gigabytes in size. So if you're using files 100 gigs in size or more than your terabyte, we want those files to be put in your bulk directory. So slash bulk and then your username. Both of these are on the Ceph file system. They're both equally as fast to access. It's just that your home directory uh, will get backed up. Uh, we don't have enough room to back up all those big files. It's still safe on both because they're striped over multiple hard disks. So if we lose a hard disk, it's not gonna be an issue. How many hard disks would we need to lose on bulk to lose data? We would need to lose three whole machines. Okay, so we would lose to, yeah, so we would have to lose three whole machines before we lost data on bulk. So we don't want you to think that it's not safe there. It's just that when we do get full backups running, uh, we're gonna do those on homes and not on bulk. So anyone using large files should get in the habit of putting that in your bulk directory. It's just as easy to access there. You can make symbolic links from your homes directory to bulk so that it looks like it's on your home directory. And if you have trouble with that, let us know. But that's one habit we want everyone to get into. If you get over a terabyte, then we're gonna start yelling at, at you and say, move your files around. And, yeah. yeah, we've actually done a good job of most people have moved their stuff over to bulk. Um, there is a scratch file system. Uh, it's not very useful at this time because it's also under Ceph. The, the other issue with with Ceph is you're limited to 100,000 files in a given directory. That sounds like a lot. It is for most people, but we do have some codes. Uh, one common one is in uh, quantum chemistry called PixAid that will put a million files in one directory. And Ceph just can't handle that right now. Luster doesn't like it either. Oh, Luster, really? None of the parallel files. 
Okay. So, so you're writing code. Do not do this. Yeah. This is a bad play. I am I am rewriting Pixade to help resolve these issues, or at least parts of it. So we will be putting Scratch in Luster soon, like end of week, right, Kyle? <laughs> Yeah, so so Luster is very much faster than uh, than Ceph is. It is still a parallel file system. Uh, it is not striped. It is very much faster. It is meant for temporary storage, but you uh, right now for codes that exceed some of these limits, we're having people run under the slash temp local disk. When we get Luster working, we'll have people running under Scratch. Uh, and then it'll be faster than the local disk. And uh, it'll allow you to look at your files that are when your jobs are running on nodes. So you, you can log in. And if your log file is being dumped to Scratch, you'll still be able to monitor it very easily just by doing a CD to it from the head node rather than having to try to attach to your job uh, in that node. So this is something coming that will be an improvement. But right now, if you need more uh, access or if you need around to get around that 100,000 file limit, um, we need to get you on local disk or on a RAM disk. So local disk, you access by uh, simply uh, dumping something to slash temp. Uh, if you're on the head node, for example, you can look at what's on slash temp. That's a very common place. How this is actually implemented is when, whenever you start up a job, it creates a directory for your job that's slash temp slash job and then the job ID number. But to you, the user, it, it's going to be accessed just like you were using slash temp. So if you want to use your temp, just write stuff to slash temp. You don't have to uh, CD to anything else. Uh, this is an example. Uh, first of all, when you're using temp, you want to request uh, the amount of space that you're going to be using. So in your sbatch script, you would do a minus minus temp, TMP equals 100G for 100 gigabytes of requested space. If you use over 130 gigs, that precludes you from using the elves. They only have about 130 gigs of uh, space in temp. Most of the systems have more like 500 or above. But that will reserve that amount of space for you and get you on the right nodes. So an example of how to use temp would be to, uh, in your script, put copy your input files to slash temp, you can make a directory slash temp slash out. And then when you're running your application, you have to direct the input and output to there. Now your application may or may not have that capability. And sometimes the applications require you to do this through environment variables. So if your application allows you to steer where the input comes from and where the output goes to, you can do it in this manner. And then at the end, always remember to copy your stuff back to your home directory. Here I copy, minus RP is recursive, P protects the, the dates on them. Everything that went into the temp out, I'm copying back to dot, which is my current working directory. If you do not copy things out at the end, when your job finishes, it cleans up slash temp and your files get deleted. So you have to remember to copy stuff back out. So again, this is using copy in and copy out, and then your application has to be able to access the paths to those. Uh, another way of doing that So again, this is Pixade. Yeah, it's minus minus job dash name equals is what I use. Okay, so here I'm asking for 100 gigs of temp space. And I'm specifically asking, well, those are commented out. 
So then with this one, uh, what I'm doing is I'm making some directories. I make a directory on temp slash temp slash out. And then here's where I'm running the code. And the code itself, this is a Python code. So I put in the Python code to use slash temp slash out as the output. So you have to work with your application on how to tell it to use that uh, directory. The other thing you can do is you can move everything over to temp, do a CD to slash temp, and then actually run your code from that as the working directory. So that's another option. But then here at the end, I copy stuff back out. And since this code deals with, again, more than 100,000 files in uh, the out directory, I actually use tar to compress and uh, to archive and compress it before I move it back. So the same thing can be done with a RAM disk. A RAM disk is using uh, RAM memory as a hard disk. So it's very fast. In a case of a RAM disk, you have to request the extra amount of memory that you're gonna use for your storage. So in PixAid, uh, in the previous one, I was asking for six gigs of RAM and 100 gig of temp space on the local disk. Now, since I'm using a RAM disk, I'm asking for 106 gigs of RAM. So 100 for the RAM disk and six gigs for the application. So again, I commented this part out because I'm not using temp space. And I'm going through the same setup, but in this case, instead of asking for memory or asking, or instead of setting up the directory in slash temp slash out, I'm using dev shm, which is the path to the RAM disk. And then again, in my Python script, I have to put that directory in there. And again, when I'm copying stuff out, I use dev, dev shm out. And when I'm tarring it up, I tar up the RAM disk stuff. Um, Slurm is also nice in that it cleans up the RAM disk afterwards with SGE. We used to have to worry about if you don't man, uh, manually delete stuff, it would leave stuff in memory behind. Adam's got it set up great so that it automatically cleans things up so it doesn't leave stuff on the nodes. Okay. Last thing I'm gonna cover on this is a RAM disk. So, or sorry, uh, array jobs. So if you're going to run more than, let's say 20 jobs that are similar, uh, we would like you to put an, them in as an array job. An array job allows you to submit lots of similar tasks as one job. Uh, this makes it easier when you do a case stat, it shows up as one job line. Uh, it makes it easier on you to control your jobs. Uh, it's easier on the scheduler because the scheduler knows that they're the same or similar jobs and it doesn't prevent your jobs from running any differently. Um, the only exception to that is if you're running array jobs of more than 300 tasks, it does limit you to 300 tasks. You can always put in multiple array jobs to get around that if you're doing that and pounding on our file server, then we may object to that, but otherwise uh, uh, that works fine. So with an array job, uh, what you do is you use minus minus arrays equals, and then you tell it the number of tasks out of the task range. So uh, array jobs, so arrays equals, and then one dash 10 would give you 10 essentially jobs, or I think you can also do one colon 10. You can also step through it. So if you did one colon 10 colon two, that would step you through by twos. 
you then have to do a little bit of shell programming. And uh, there's a couple different ways that you can do this. Uh, let's see. So you can, the basic thing, uh, since you're submitting one sbatch script, you're going to tell it to do different things based entirely on the slurm array task ID. So this is going to be what determines what data set it runs on or what parameters you use that's different in each of your runs. And so it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to run the same application with different input parameters, uh, then you can use slurm array task to determine which one uh, you're choosing for a given one. If you're trying to use a different data set, uh, then you can uh, use that in your file name. I'll give you one example here of one that we developed. Uh, it's probably easier than me describing it. So this is one that I worked on with Antrix here. And so most of this looks the same. Nodes, tasks. So here we're asking for uh, one node, one task per node. We're actually mostly doing eight tasks per node with these. And then this was just our testing here. Um, he may be running as many as 25,000 array jobs here. So this would be 25,000. I think that exceeds our limit now is 20,000, kind of thing. Uh, limit is 25,000. OK. So this would allow him to submit 25,000 jobs at once with one script. And what you see here is we've generated a loop that has a counter. The counter goes, basically counts up until we hit the slurm ta array task ID that this particular one is going to do. It reads from a given file of file names. So here's the, the file names are in. So file names is actually the, the name of the file that we're getting the file names from. And then we're reading into a variable file name and incrementing the count. So when we get to the right one, um, yeah. So when we get to the right one, we'll have a different file name each time. It'll bail out of this loop. And then here's where it'll actually run. So again, uh, if you debug this, the first array that gets, the first job that gets launched will have slurm array task ID set to one. It'll come here, count will be zero. It'll read a file name. It'll increment count to one. It'll hit the loop again. It'll say, well, it's no longer less than, so I'm going to bail. But we have the variable file name out of here. And then we go down here and we use that. That'll be the first file name that we read out of that file. And it'll do the Perl script with that. So any questions on this? Yeah. If, if the files were named incrementally from like 1 to 100, they could just yep. use, use So ID. he's using file names that are not incremental. But you can certainly, uh, instead of reading it from a file, you can have you know, your base name, dot, and then your slurm ID task. So that's very commonly used. So that's a good question. Yeah, so for people on Zoom, you could use for a file name, you could use, you can have it increment the, uh, the file name. You can use file names that are increments and have the slurm task ID be your increment rather than reading file names in. So, uh, let me just, uh, so this is actually our list of file names that it's reading from. And in this case, you can see that they're not incremental. So we start at 17 and go to 33 and 50. So if it was starting at 50 and going 100, 150, 200, then we could, we could step through with the Slurm task ID 
and set our, our step to 50. But Andrusks had to be difficult, so we had to be a little trickier. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So they skip around, which is why we had to do this. So, so this is a more advanced one. And again, here, this is our test here, but our normal run would be this way, where we'd be running only 1,775 of these. But in each job here, we're doing 10 individual runs. So we're still counting up, and when we get to our SLURM task ID, we're reading a file name, we're copying stuff to slash temp uh, because we want to get around some of the limitations on files per directory. We're running it, then we read another file name, and et cetera. But we're doing 10 things at a time this time um, because each of these jobs might only last three to 10 minutes. And if we stacked up 10, we can get around some of the overhead of having too little time for each of the jobs. So, and this is working pretty well for us now. And again, this is an example of using temp. And at the end, we're copying stuff back out of temp here. So we got around several uh, problems with that. Okay, so let me go back to my web browser. Maybe. I need to take a break here, and then let's uh, yep. and we'll close off this part of the room while we're at it. Yeah, let me uh, finish up by saying I think I'm finished. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so everyone's gonna have to move over to this side, and then Brandon's gonna, uh, I ran him out of time, so he's got 20 seconds instead of 20 minutes. So. <laughs> Hi, it's nice to see you, bud. <laughs> yeah. So in other words, he gets 15 minutes, and the rest comes out of my time at the end. So, so we're going to close off the room, and so take just a couple minute break. Each test will also do 10 curls. Each test does 10 curls per step. And again, when each test is only doing three to 10 minutes runs, there's startup time for getting out, and you don't want to slam up the time. So it's just a little more generous to make it an hour or two. And again, the support rate is running yeah. out of codes. They're done now. It took us a while to get there. Right now. We had to work around 100,000 uh, file limits. We just did all script there. It will go there. It's taking a little bit of file. After that, it's an output of this input. So, if you're running 25,000 crazy things, so that's we we could have just put some curls in that, but it forced to do this. So so now that you know we're in four hours, what? You're down to fifteen minutes max. There's no way I can cover that much. Right. Oh, don't ask a question. Yes. Yeah, that's 
Yeah. Everybody hear me? All right. So I'm going to cover you guys a little bit about Git. So for those of you who don't know, Git is basically version control for software development, lets you track your history, um, keep changes, revisions, and things like that. So as you're developing code, you have a long history of everything you've done to that code, all the changes you've made, files added, lines removed, added, things like that. <clears throat> we host our own um, Git here at, at K-State. We actually have two, one in the computer science, one for Baocat. Since you guys are on Baocat, you'll probably use that one. Um, if you have a Baocat account, you can log in through the LDAP. I'm about to do. Oh, yeah, no lock on. No, no lock wasn't on. I'm used to it being on. Or I can't type, never mind. <laughs> it's been a long day. Leave me alone. There we go. All right. So this is the interface for GitLab here, hosting on Baocat. And so as you can see, I have a lot of projects, but this is kind of what your interface is going to look like when you pull it up with your projects. So the first thing to do is create an actual project for your project you're going to be doing. Uh, really simple. You click the button that says new project. Um, a lot of this is really self-explanatory. So you can create your project name. Uh, yes, typing is hard, people. Shush. Um, so you create this, usually you want to give it a little bit of a description. I'm not going to bother with that for time's sake. I will hit some of the high points here um, when we talk about visibility level, because this may or may not be important depending on what you're doing for development wise. So private is exactly what that means. You and only you have access to it unless you grant others access, which you have to manually grant. So this is a good way if you're doing some development that needs to not be vis publicly visible. Internal here means that any logged in user, so if I'm logged in as a Baocat user and I've authenticated through LDAP and I'm logged in, it is visible to me. Even if it's your project, I can go in there and see it. And that's only for logged in users. And then obviously public is what it means. Public is if everybody in the world can see it and clone it and download it. They can't push to it, but they can clone it, download and use it. So those are important. <clears throat> Create your project. This is gonna be the page you get after you create it. Now right now, the project is empty. There's no files, no nothing in there. And Git is gonna get mad at you if you try to clone an empty repository. You can do it. It's just gonna complain at you. So the easiest thing to do is click one of these blue things here, either the README, the license, or the Git ignore. I almost always do the README because you're gonna to wanna to read me. And the README is just a longer version of the description, kind of tells what your project is, what it does, and all the prereqs you need for it. Um, I'm not gonna do any of that. <laughs> Don't do what I just did. <laughs> and then we commit this. So at this point, we now have our base 
project started and we're ready to start cloning and using this for our version control. A um, couple of things I'll highlight on here, and they've rechanged the interface. I want to find something specific here. Here, um, one of the nice things about the web interface, and you can even do this on the command line um, and other things in the Git GUI. But one of the things on here, you can come in and you can look at the commit history, so you can see when you've committed last, or if you're working on a team who's done all the last commits. Uh, really useful information there, uh, which brings you to another point when you commit. There is a place for a message. Please put a very meaningful message. Not long, doesn't need to be a paragraph, but meaningful. When I say meaningful is, here's what I completed, here's what needs to be done, concise, good to go. It'll save you in the long run when you go back, why did I do this? A <laughs> um, Couple other real nice things you can look at here um, real fast is graphs. So nothing interesting in here because I just created it. But here you'd be able to see a bunch of different things. I can get to one of my other ones to show you later. So, but the big point is we have it created and we we're ready to use it. So now what do I do with it? I have it up here. You need it on your local machine to work with, right? So you're gonna do what's called a clone and you're gonna basically make an exact replica of what's on, online and bring it down to your machine. And you can do this one of two ways. As you can see, we have SSH and we have HTTPS. Unless you've, you have to go through a lot of steps to set up your SSH keys, which I don't have time in 15 minutes to show you to go through this. Um, it's pretty much self-explanatory. They do have a good tutorial. If you need help, come let us know. Um, so for right now, you can just do HTTPS and you're it's just like a URL, you're gonna copy that. Now, if you're in Windows and you have Git, you'll need to install Git, so I personally like the bash. There's also a GUI. Git bash is awesome. <clears throat> so you're here, you've made your project, you're ready to get it down to your computer. Um, and I'll be okay, you're pretty much only gonna have the command line anyway, so get used to it. <laughs> so you do a git clone. That's the command that says I wanna clone that remote repo. And then I'm gonna paste in that URL. And huzzah, it's gonna prompt you for credentials because you're using HTTPS. Done, you should see that, it's cloned the repo. I uh, probably should have put that in a better spot, whatever. There. So now I CD to it. You see I have my readme in there, so everything's good. The other real basic commands that you're gonna use, I'll go through real quick. So let me create a text file in here real quick. I have no idea where the hell I put that, actually. Uh, this PC. That's a good question. I'm gonna move that. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's just see the documents. That makes it easier. Just means that cut off on the bottom down there. Ah, there we go. Uh, is everybody okay with seeing that? I know that this font's kind of small. Anyway, so we'll see the documents, and then I'll just re that. Doesn't matter. All right, so now we're back in here. All right, so we will, I'm gonna create a temporary document in that folder. Who we logged in under? There we go. I didn't put it in there. I'm having a hard time reading that. Oh well. Hmm. Why is it not showing up in that list? No, uh, FileZilla or 7-Zip yet. Why? 
did they take away Follies for? Ah, fine, whatever. We're gonna do this stuff. This is why you should always try something out before demoing it. <laughs> exactly. That's whatever. Uh, this has VI in it. Oh. I always just use VI. It's fine. So, oh, I know what it is. CD. That's what I wanted. Yeah. Uh, also, don't do this when you haven't had enough caffeine. <laughs> so now you see the README and you see a test in there, right? Um, now there's a couple steps you have to go through now to get what you have locally back up to your remote repo. And one is you have to add all the changes you've just made. And so that's done with an easy quick git add. Now I can specify just that test file I just made because I only want to add that to the repo. Or if I've made a bunch of changes or added a lot of files and want to add them all at once, you can just do a dot on the end. And that just basically is a wild card that says add everything. And so it's going to say, hey, oh, and that warning's fine. It's just, it's telling you it's replacing things from Windows with actual things that are Linux based. <clears throat> so now I've added that all. And now we have to actually commit that so that it, it logs those changes in the git ignore. And so we're going to do a git commit. And if you're on the command line, I told you about get meaning mess messages, meaningful. So right here, you do a dash M parameter and that says do a message. And technically I could have skipped the last step with the add by putting a dash A dash M, dash A M, but I like the add. Um, and then I'm gonna just put a message in here. And again, that one is not good. Awesome, I was hoping this pop up. So your first time running this, you're almost always gonna see this. And what Git is complaining about is it doesn't know who you are or who's posting to the repo. So it's going to want you to configure these and you follow that command, right? And it's simple. Uh, fig. And again, spelling. It is really hard to see that from back here. Wow. And so all I'm doing is telling Git to configure my username. And I just mashed that up. It's double dashes. You know what? Mine are in my backpack and I forgot them. Shut up. Um, it's been a while since I've had to do this config. Oh no, it's just dash. It's just going to be. I think that's where the dashes go. Ugh, I've not had enough caffeine today, let me tell you. There it is, it's no dashes, that's why. So you do username and then generally I do my email as well. Right? And then you would put in your email here, it's really easy. And now I've configured it, now it will be happy if I try to do my commit. It's not gonna yell at me anymore. Yay. So we've committed and now we need to get what we have local up to the remote. And so we're gonna do a git push. And git push will be like, hey, look, boom, look, I moved it up, it's now online. So now if we, tab, if we go back over to our online project here, and I showed you earlier where we were looking at the list of commits. Hey, look, there's the new one. I added a test. And so you'll be able to see that. And now if we actually go back to the graphs, you'll see, hey, look, I moved things. This is where the, the repo moved from one position to the next. And so that's kind of your basic things. The, one of the other things I'll suggest to you is if you work on multiple machines like I tend to do a lot, and I make commits from more than one machine, 
you should get in the habit of doing a fetch and a pull every time right off the bat to make sure that your local copy on the machine you're working on is the same as the remote. And so if you just do a get, and the reason I say get fetch is if you can't remember which machine you did last, fetch will tell you whether or not you're on that and then you do a get pull and you're up to date. So if, if, if nothing's changed, it doesn't matter. If stuff's changed, it'll pull it down. And like I said, I tend to work on three or four different computers and I always forget which one was the last one I committed on. <laughs> so I use this every time. And it's just something I encourage you to do. Just use the fetch and the pull fairly often. In fact, I do it as first thing I do when I log in and I'm planning on working on code, I do a fetch and a pull. And that way I know I'm current with what's in my repo. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is you don't have to push right away. So you can keep your commits local. If you, there, there, there's a couple of different philosophies on that. So you can keep your commits local. If you're working all day, commit often. So those saves are cha those changes are saved. And then I know people who do own commission commit at the end of the, or the push at the end of the day that pushes all of those commits. So it's successive. You have to add, you can't, you can't push till you commit. You can't commit till you add but you don't have to do the successive one after you can just add or just commit or, you know what I mean? Um, so there's that, um, kind of the big philosophy is really just version control. So say your code was working yesterday, you made some changes. Now it's broken. You can go back and say, okay, move this head from here to here where it was working and I'll start over. And it just basically says that broken parts goes away. I don't care about it anymore. Right. Um, yep. What, what, what did I change? I yeah, so if you can't remember what you changed that broke it, you can pull those up and every commit will show you what was added, what was deleted, what lines and what files, so all of that's trackable. And there are some really more advanced things if you're working in a team that I would encourage you guys to look up and read on like branching and merging and things like that when you have merge conflicts. It's really too advanced for the 15 minutes we have here, but there's a lot with Git and you don't have to just do it for the interesting is it's not just for code development. Honestly, if you're writing a book, you could do that there too, because it would track as you update paragraphs and things like anything you want to keep changing or versions of you can do in here, documentation, um, anything like that. So it's really just an overall really powerful tool to keep track of things as you change them. Um, things like that. Any kind of questions? I know this was fast. It's really basic. There's lots of really good tutorials and if you get stuck, I recommend setting up the SSH keys, but I'm lazy and I don't like typing in my username and password. So as minimal typing as possible. So if you guys need help with that, there's plenty of tutorials online. The Git repo we host here has its own little thing when you click set up SSH keys. And if you get stuck on that, I or Adam or Kyle should be able to help you guys get through SS key, SSH key stuff. So um, yeah. Okay. It is something I should use more often too. Yes, with how much you change code. <laughs> Five full screen. Yeah. As long as you need Thanks. it, we'll, we'll, we'll support it. Definitely encourage you guys to use that if you do need it. Okay, so the next uh, stuff that I want to go over is kind of to give you a flavor of what is high performance computing. Uh, not all of you are going to uh, do multi node stuff, but it's good to give you a flavor of it so that you're aware of. Uh, what different types of programming uh, are involved, and you'll know it when you see it. So I'm going to go over a general discussion of what is high performance computing, and I don't expect you to get a lot of this. Uh, there's a lot of good tutorials if you actually want to do programming in any of these uh, methods, uh, but again, it's just good to expose you to some of this stuff. So. I'll start out with just a generic picture of what BeoCAD is. 
when you get on BioCat, we have two head nodes, uh, EOS and Climbing. Uh, those are the nodes that you do your uh, compilations on, you set up your data with, all that kind of stuff. Uh, when you get to running code, you'll submit it to Slurm, the scheduler, and the scheduler puts it on uh, one of the nodes, the compute nodes, depending on how you set up your script. Our current compute nodes, going from oldest to newest, we have six mages with a terabyte of memory. We have 83 elves, a lot of those are down at the moment and may be down permanently or repurposed. Both those systems, uh, the elves and the mages, are about five years old or over, older, so they're uh, towards the tail end of their lifetime. Uh, newer nodes are hero nodes, is what we call them. These have the Haswell processors, 24 cores. Most of them have 128 gigs. And again, fast uh, communications. And the dwarves also have the Haswells, but 32 cores. And again, 128 gigs. 12 of these, 12 GPUs in these, and some higher level 100 gigabit networking that we're still playing with. But these are good core workout horses here. These are uh, good new machines. Uh, and then we just got 120 moles in. These are 20 core Broadwell chips. 32 gigs of RAM, so they are smaller memory. They still have good networking connections in the 32 gigabits per second. We're still doing a little tuning on that. The other uh, thing to mention here is only one gigabit per second ethernet. So where that comes in is that's the access to the file server. So the moles have slow access to the file server and they're smaller in memory. But other than that, they have the Broadwells are newer chips than the Haswells. Uh, 20 cores instead of the 24 or 32 cores. But still, these are very good machines. Uh, they're just made for running uh, smaller memory jobs and jobs that don't pound on uh, the file server as much. Um, we have 7,000 Intel cores total on just over 300 compute nodes. Again, good InfiniBand, uh, good networking in between um, all of them. Uh, one petabyte effective file server. We're setting up nightly incremental backups. We have 12 GPUs in the nodes, and we actually have an order that's uh, a little over 20 new machines coming in with four GPUs per node. So we're really expanding on our GPU uh, capabilities. We're also adding two large memory machines in. Right now, our large memory machines, our largest memory machines, are the six mages with a terabyte of memory in. The two new machines are going to have one and a half terabytes of memory. And they're going to have some uh, Tesla class P100 graphics processors that do good computations at double precision. Uh, the, the other GPUs we have are mostly single precision capable, and a lot of classical MD codes can use those, uh, but not all codes can be accelerated by those. So that's kind of an overview of the system. Uh, so I just want to go over what a high performance computing system is, and I'm going to start out by going back maybe 30 years or so and showing you what a basic system is from back then. It was very simple times in that you had a single processor, memory, the program and data would be in that memory. When you did things, you did things one at a time, so it was conceptually very easy. Here is a, an example of a vector addition. To do that, what would happen is it would start by loading x0, pulling that up, you'd pull y0 up, you'd do the x0 plus y0 in the processor, and then that would get shoved down into memory. Now there is some cache memory up here that I'm not showing, so it'd get pushed into cache and eventually pushed back here. 
but things are very simple when you think about this conceptually. Optimizing code was very easy. Uh, you just had to minimize the number of computations. But, uh, okay, and so this is an example code in C of how to do this. Uh, if you don't understand C code, I'm just gonna explain some of the basics. Uh, my mouse pointer keeps disappearing. Okay, I'm doing an array size of a million. I'm, uh, here's where I'm allocating the memory space for it. One million times the size of a double precision number for the vectors X, Y, and Z. Here's where I'm initializing X and Y. X of I is just gonna be I, double precision of I. Y is gonna be I times I. This is the loop where we actually do the vector addition. So again, I'm setting up my loop from zero to a million. I'm just doing Z of I is X of I plus Y of I. And then I'm printing out the first 100. So very simple code here. Um, I have this code. I have uh, some sample S batch scripts. I have the slides here all in this directory. So uh, if you do a copy minus RP of slash home slash Dave Turner slash Baocat workshop space tilde, that'll put it all in your home directory. Tilde is your home directory. And then if you CD to Baocat workshop, you can actually run these if you want. I'm gonna go through them pretty fast, so I don't know if you'll be able to keep up, but if you wanna go back and look at the slides and do some of these, this will allow you to practice doing some of the module loads and do the actual, compu the actual uh, compilations here. IC so I module load IOMKL, then I have the ICC compiler, vec underscore add dot C is this file, and then minus O, I'm naming the executable vec add ICC. Running it, you can do that with just dot slash vec add ICC. I also have an S batch script set up so that you can uh, submit it to the queue. It's it's just gonna run on one core is the way it's set up. This example down below there is how to do the exact same with the GNU compiler. So module load FOSS GCC on the file and I'm renaming the executable with a GCC at the end and then you can uh, run it with that. You can also alter the S batch file so that it runs that version. So this is the core example file. We're slowly gonna add more complexity to this as I walk you through time. Um, so after using scalar computers like that, that were very simple, the next innovation that came up were vector computers. And these are the Cray vector computers. Uh, instead of using silicon technology, these used gallium arsenide technology, which is faster, but it required custom development of, of all the gallium arsenide uh, technology. So it was very expensive. But what we got out of that, in addition to these neat looking computers here, were, was the ability to do vector computations. What I mean by vector computations is instead of doing one thing at a time, you could do 64 things at a time. So here's a diagram of the vector processor. More memory here. I'm showing a much wider memory bus to get up to the vector processor. Because when you load stuff, when you do the same vector add, now instead of loading X0 up, you're pulling X0 through X63 up at one point into the vector processor registers. Then you're pulling Y0 through Y63 up. And then you're doing the 64 computations essentially at the same time and then you're storing them. So the whole idea is every time you hit a loop, you're doing 64 things at a time instead of just one. So hopefully you're doing things 64 times as fast. This is true in vector computing. It's also true in, in parallel computing. The trick with either is that you have to speed up every loop that you're dealing with. 
If you don't, then you get bad performance. So this is an example where if you have three loops, the first taking 30 seconds, the second 20, the third 50, let's say you can speed up the first two by 64 times, but not the third one for some reason. So the first one would take 30 over 64 seconds, so less than a second. Second takes less than a second, but now the third one we can't speed up, so it takes the full 50 seconds. So now we've sped up our code from 100 seconds down to about 51. It's only twice as fast, all because it's that very last loop that we couldn't speed up. So again, you're only gonna get that big jump in performance if you speed up every loop. Now what could limit you from speeding up that third loop? If you have a print statement in there, that's not vectorizable, but more commonly, you would have things like, if, you're, if each iteration depends on the previous one, then you can't do 64 things at the same time. If there's that dependency in there, that breaks it. That means you'd have to go in and reprogram it so that there isn't that dependency, or maybe your code just isn't vectorizable. Okay, so gallium arsen arsenide technology was very expensive. You had to customize things. Uh, people figured out that, well, we're better off just using the, tech, the silicon technology. We have economies of scale. The processors are very good. Let's throw lots of these processors at the same task. And that was the birth of cluster computing. So cluster computing is parallel computing. Uh, now we're doing, we're running the same program on different processors, uh, on different computers, but each code is the same. It's just working on a different part of the problem. Um, in the case of our vector uh, addition, it's pretty simplistic in that uh, uh, each of these computations is very independent of the other. So in this case, I decided to divide up the program by putting all the even numbered elements on computer zero and all the odd ones on computer one. And then to calculate zero, Z zero, it's already got X zero and Y zero on, I don't have to communicate. So this would be an example of an embarrassingly parallel code. I essentially, once I distribute the data at the beginning, I don't have to communicate to do the problem. Things get complicated very quickly. This is a very simple code that does a matrix multiply. So over here is your formula for each element, z sub ij, we just do a sum of k equals zero to three, x sub ik times y sub kj. Now conceptually very simple, this would be just a few line program on a scalar system, but if you do this in a parallel computer, you have to have the x and y values in the same place at the same time to do this computation. And so uh, I'll let you read through it if you want, but you have to do several stages of broadcasting blocks down the rows, shifting them in vertical directions and so forth in order to choreograph all the communications to get things in the right place at the right time. So this is the type of work that I would actually sit down and do. I don't have to do this because there's libraries that people have done this before me, but I've done stuff like this. And there's tricks to doing this. While you're doing the, the computations, you can be setting up the communications and trying to hide those, hide the communication costs behind your computations and things like that. This slide is just to show you that things in parallel computing can get very complicated very quickly if you're the one that has to choreograph all this work. Now, Cluster computing, we're, we're, uh, we're passing messages between nodes, and that's done with what's called the message passing uh, initiative, or MPI. MPI is a library. All the commands to use the MPI library are MPI underscore, and then these are the first three commands you'll see in any MPI library. So this is the kind of stuff that I want you to get out of this is not to know all the intricate details of how you do it, but just to kind of get a flavor so that if you see MPI underscore and then 
these functions in your code, you know that, hey, this is a multi-node capable uh, code. So MPI init, uh, when you do your MPI run, that starts the same code on different processes, whether they're in the same node or different nodes. MPI init just does the handshaking, so they all say, oh, I see you over there, you're part of my group. Now we know we're a group of nodes working, on, or a group of processes working on the same job. MPI com sci, size will return this value nprox. That tells you the number of processes in your group, and my proc tells you which process you are. So if you have 16 processes in your group, my proc for your particular processor will be a, a number between zero and 15. That's how you divide up who does what work, is specifically on my proc and nprox. So that's why you see those three functions at the beginning of every MPI code. In this case, I'm just passing one token between two different nodes. So one token, a token is a variable here. So this conditional here is how I'm dividing up the workload. I have two processes in this case. Process zero is gonna start by sending a variable to process one, and then it's gonna wait for something coming back. This else command is going to be the second process. It's going to receive that and then echo it back with a send command. So the order of things is process zero is, process one's gonna come here and wait for something to come in. Process zero is gonna come here and send. After it's sent, then there's a message that comes in here then process one is gonna send it out. Process zero will be here waiting. When it gets it, then it can leave this loop and then they'll both print something out here and then MPI finalizes the last part. So again, this is an example of using MPI on a very simple case. I put another code in that directory that's a ping pong code that again just bounces stuff back and forth that you can look at. There are a lot of tutorials that will get you up to speed a lot faster. I just want to give you a flavor and say, if you see a code that's like this, those are message passing commands. You're passing data, you give it a buffer, you give it a length, you tell it what node to pass to, and the user has to choreograph all that. Okay, multi-core systems is the next step up. So we started with clusters that had just simple scalar machines, one compute core uh, per machine connected by a network. Now we're up to multi-core. Sh I'm showing 16 cores on a box. This would be similar to our elves. You still have shared memory. You have a wide bus going up to those processors. And there's multiple ways to program this. You could run that same MPI program on this where one of the processes is on, one, on P0 here and one is on P1, and they're just communicating between those two. In that case, instead of passing a message across the network, it would just do a memory copy between two regions of memory. The other way to program this is with OpenMP or some multi-threaded package. OpenMP is, is the more, most common of those. It's easier to program. The data is all in a shared area. So you don't have to move the data around. You just have multiple threads, all or most multiple threads, one on each process processor, working on different data in the same, same shared memory area. This is kind of a simplistic diagram of how it would work. <coughs> Excuse me. You have a master thread running the scalar part of your code. Then whenever you hit a loop where there's a lot of work to do, you would spawn off your full 16 threads if you're using this whole machine. And each of those 16 threads would work on a different part of uh, the memory, a different part of the data. Then when you're done with your loop, you collapse down to the master thread. And then the next time you hit a loop, you again expand up to your 16 threads. So again, each time you hit a loop, uh, you're having 
multiple processors work on that loop, kind of in the same way that in a vector processor you had uh, multiple, uh, you had the vector doing 16 or 64 things at the same time. Here you can have 16 threads working on the same loop at the same time, but just different parts of the data. So it's actually a fairly easy way, easier way of doing things, but with OpenMP, you are only operating on cores within a given node. So you can never do multiple node stuff. Here again is our example of uh, a vector add, but with a couple changes, uh, we have to include the OMP or OpenMP library or header information here. Down here, I'm setting the number of threads to four and then OMP set num threads. So within the code, I'm telling it to run on four threads or four cores only. Everything else is pretty much the same till you get down to this uh, compiler flag that says pragma. O OMP is OpenMP parallel forks. So I'm going to parallelize automatically this for loop. And what this is going to do is each thread is going to work on part of this loop. I'm not telling it how to do that. The OpenMP system is going to determine that for itself. I can give it some directions. I could tell it to have the first part, or the first thread work on the first quarter, the second thread work on the second quarter. I could tell it that, uh, that each thread is going to take each fourth one in the loop and things like that, or I could tell it to just work on it dynamically. You know, whenever you need a new chunk, go out and get it. Uh, so I can give it those directions. I didn't feel the need to here, so the system's going to decide that when it runs. But each thread is just going to do some of these processes here. In order to do this, you compile it the same, but you have to specify to compile it with OpenMP. With Intel compiler, you do that with the minus Q OpenMP flag. With the GNU compiler, you do a minus F OpenMP. And then when you run it, right now I'm setting the number of threads. I'm hard coding it in here. Another way of doing it is if I comment that line out, then I can set it up through an, an environment variable, OMP num threads, and I could actually put this in my script so that if I run on a different numbers of, of cores, I can set this to the number of slurm tasks that I have automatically so that the code will adjust. Then I only have to change the number of threads when I request it and it automatically gets fed through. Okay, any questions on that? So you're either getting everything or nothing. So we are going to continue to add complexity. So we added multi-core. Now, now we're doing multi-core clusters. So instead of scalar clusters, now each of our systems has multi-cores, but is connected by a network switch. So again, since we're doing uh, multi-node, we have to do MPI between the nodes. We can still do MPI within a node, which is what this shows, where I'm showing this being eight tasks. These would be eight MPI tasks. Each one has its own area and its own processor. So you can do MPI within a node and MPI between nodes if you want. That's probably the most common way because you only have to do the MPI programming. You can also do hybrid programming where you do MPI between nodes and open MPI within a node. In some cases, this is more efficient, but you have to program in two levels of parallelism. So I just don't see this being done very often. Okay, adding another level of complexity. Now we're up to vector multi-core computers. So now in addition to uh, multi-core, each of these processors this is now a vector processor like the old Cray systems, but we're not doing 64 things at the same time. The elves can do two things at a time if you're talking about double precision numbers. The Haswells, which are our heroes and dwarves, 
um, can do four things at a time if you're talking double precision. Single precision uh, can do eight at a time. There's also Intel five processors, which we don't have, that can actually do eight doubles at a time or 16 single precision floats. So vector processing does come in. Um, you, it's difficult to use and somewhat buggy. It, Intel is doing better every year, but I still don't see very many examples of where we're seeing codes run twice as fast on our Haswell processors as on our ELF processors, which you should see if codes are really vectorizing well. Um, I have one physics code that I hand tuned. It was a triple loop with, with two lines of code in it that I hand tuned so that it does do vector processing. And yes, it does run twice as fast on the Haswells as the older systems but I had to jump through a lot of hoops to do something very simple. Um, so there's a lot of potential speed up. I just don't see a lot of codes that are actually doing this well. That's unfortunate. Um, let's skip over that. Okay, so again, parallel computing, this is kind of the same thing as I mentioned with the vector computing, the goal of parallel computing is to get an n times speed up if you're using n processes, whether those are on the same node or on different nodes. And again, each compute node is typically running an identical program. Uh, it's up to the programmer to divide the work up and choreograph all the exchange of data. Uh, if you want more information on the message passing uh, initiative, this is a pretty good tutorial. If you just Google MPI tutorial, you'll get lots of these. Uh, again, uh, Lawrence Livermore also has a good one on OpenMP uh, here. Uh, so I think these two are pretty good. But again, if you just to Google OpenMP tutorial, you'll get some other good ones in there too. OK, so communication. So I want to talk a little bit about more things from the user point of view now, rather than giving you an overview. So communication between processes is one thing that's key to how well your parallel program is going to run. Um, I've said a couple times that we have pretty decent uh, performance on our networking in that we have somewhere between 30 and 40 gigabits per second of bandwidth and a low latency of 1.5 microseconds. What a latency is, it's the minimum amount of time it takes to send a packet, a package from uh, one node to another. And 1.5 microseconds is very good. Uh, if you just use Ethernet, that'd be 10 microseconds or more. Um, these graphs over here on the right, I know that they're very small and you probably can't read the, uh, the magnitudes on them. What these are showing are typical communication curves. Uh, the bandwidth is on the vertical scale and the message size is on the horizontal scale. So on the left side of this graph, everything is limited by the latency or the minimum amount of time it takes to do the handshaking and uh, communicate that first packet of, you know, as small as eight bytes, for example. So if you're sending eight bytes across, it's going to take 1.5 microseconds on these. If you're going to send 1,000 bytes, it's going to take 1.5 microseconds. So maybe a little bit more. If you send a megabyte, then you're going to be limited by the bandwidth here, the max bandwidth, more than that small amount. So when you're talking communications, you're really talking two numbers. If you're doing lots of small packets, you're limited by the latency. If you're doing large amounts, you're limited by the max bandwidth. Um, our newer machines are gonna have 100 gigabit per second bandwidth between them and the same low latency. So if you are running multi-node stuff, our new nodes are gonna be much better at handling those. If you're doing communications within a node, again, OpenMP shares data, so you're not moving it. 
if you do MPI codes or on the same node, then when you communicate between two uh, processes, you're doing a mem copy. The mem copy can take on the order of 60 gigabits per second and a pretty low latency. So that's pretty decent. It's still faster than communicating uh, off node by quite a bit. And faster memory can speed that up too. It depends on where your data is sitting and so forth. Uh, I'm not going to touch on network topology. And again, file access, uh, I kind of touched on that. We have pretty good file access. We're really seeing kind of a topping out of about 20 gigabits per second. Uh, uh, where did Adam go? He left. He left. OK. What, what's the max that Seth can use? I, I perf for TCP, I get about 20 that's gigs. Right. That, that, that's, that's what we're practically getting. OK. Seth is not looking like that. That's, that's OK. So we can see roughly 20 gigabits per second getting to the file server. We can handle that on most of our nodes. The elf and mage nodes are limited to 10 gigabits. So the hero and dwarf nodes can see the full 20 gigs to the file server. The current uh, moles are limited again to one gigabit so that's not where you're going to want stuff that can that's going to depend on the file server access so one common question when you're running a parallel application is how many processors should i run on and when you start running a job you know i can't answer that for you the first thing you should do is what's called a scaling test so you should tape, take a typical size run that you're going to do, and you should run it on one core, two cores, four cores, eight cores, and 16 cores, which is what I did in this example. I use the time command in front of my executable. So if I was running an MPI job, I would do time, space, MPI run, space, the number of cores, space, and then your application. And that'll report the real time that you're using uh, in your application. So submit a one core job, and let's say I get back that it took 10 hours, while two cores took five hours. Well, that's great. That's twice the speed on two cores. That's ideal speed up. Now we go to our four core run. I was hoping for 2.5 hours, but instead got 2.8. So I lost some in the, in the efficiency. But that's still pretty good, a 3.6 times speed up on four cores. And in this example, I'm getting a 6.7x speed up on eight cores. That's still pretty good. But here I slow down a lot. I go up to 16 cores. I'm not gaining much. So in this case, my advice would be don't run on 16 cores. Run your jobs on eight cores. And you know, if you have lots of jobs to run, then you can run twice as many as you could on 16 cores anyway. But this would be good efficient use of your code. If, you're, if your jump is less than 50%, then it's not really worth doing it. You're wasting resources. If you later on go to a larger data set, you should retest this because more data means your communications are going to be different. If you go to smaller, you might be more latency bound. So your efficiency might not, you, you might be listed to four, limited to four cores instead of eight, for example. So the same is true, what if you have a multi-node job? Well, the same is true, run it on one node, run it on two nodes, run it on four nodes. It's harder to do multi-node jobs. Um, multi-node jobs used to be very common 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, but the computational power of each node has gotten, uh, has increased very fast and faster than the communications has. So even though we can do 100 gigabit per second communications now, the nodes have gotten, the processors on each node have gotten faster and there's more cores per node. So they've just gotten so powerful, it's difficult now to do multi-node jobs. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Uh, if you have a code that you're going to try, uh, again, do the same kind of scaling test, but do it multi-node now. And if you get into this kind of stuff, touch base with me. I enjoy doing this, and I can help you uh, walk you through this. 
You can see some job interactions. So if you're running on eight cores and someone else is running on eight cores in the same machine, that can affect your job. We really don't see too much of this. But if you're using, uh, let's say you're on an ELF where there's 10 gigabits to the file server and you're running there and you might be conflicting with another job that's also pounding heavily on that same uh, uh, 10 gigabits. So you might only get half that. So it does occur. Uh, you can get con conflicts for the main memory bandwidth. We really haven't seen too much of that. Uh, the file server is probably the bigger one that I would worry about. And if you go onto our heroes or dwarves, there's 40 gigs and you can only max out to the file server at about 20 gigs anyway. So you're safe on there. But it is something to be aware of. Uh, ignore this minus L exclusive. That's uh, from the, the uh, SGE days. Uh, application profiling, if you get into code development, I have a, a profiling library I can set you up with. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about software installation. Some of what I went over kind of fast was compiling individual files. So if your code ha is a C file or a Fortran file or a different language, uh, you can compile that in one step with a compiler and just type it out and not worry about it. Most software packages are much larger. They might have hundreds of files, uh, a bunch of header files. They might be in different directories. If you are installing something like that, chances are there's already a, a make file available. What a make file is, is it's a list of dependencies. For example, uh, if you have a C file, a C file will depend on a header file or a series of header files. All those dependencies are in the make file. So that if you change the header file, it knows to go back and recompile the C file every time you type make. Uh, so those dependencies are already built in for you. And so typically what you do in uh, compiling software, if it's set up right, is to do these three steps here. Configure, make, make, install. With configure, it'll mostly try to put it as a system install which doesn't work because none of you have root access. So if you do this, it is likely to give you an error message where it says SU for it couldn't do a sudo and uh, messages pop up for Adam and Kyle to see. Yeah, and they will laugh at you behind your back. <laughs> it's, you're trying to do something as root that you cannot do. If you try to do it multiple times, they will email you and tell you you can't do this. So that just means that you forgot to put or didn't know that you had to put this prefix. This prefix tells configure that you're gonna put it in this directory. So I have a certain directory apps, and then I would put the app name here, and that would tell it where to install it. Then I would type make, make install. It would be nice if every software package was this easy, but it's not. Uh, in some cases, there's no configure script, there's no make install, there is a make file in a lot. So sometimes you just have to get in and edit the make file. So that's not bad. Hopefully there's a readme file. Readme files are great because uh, that should tell you the simple directions for how to uh, install that software package. Others are more difficult. Uh, often things just don't go, don't work like they should. Uh, I've had software packages where I've had to try compiling them as many as 60 times before I got them to work. Some say they compile fine with the Intel compilers, but I, I couldn't ever get them to work because the authors compile under one set of circumstances where they have one particular level of Intel compiler with one type of math library, and there may be a half dozen libraries that have to be the exact same level, and they just don't do broad enough testing for them. So 
you're, for codes that uh, are not needed by a lot of groups, you're responsible for compiling them. But if you at least start, at least read the readme file and try to get through them and run into problems, then email us and we will help you. This is an example of one that's actually pretty good. This is a bioinformatics code called Abyss. This is C++ code. It's got a professional development team up in Canada. There's a readme file, configure, you put the prefix in there. Uh, I had to put one more thing to choose the maximum camera size. This does depend on a sparse hash library. So I had to compile and install this myself first, and I have to pass that in as a flag. But then I just do make and make install. So this is fairly straightforward. I did have to read the readme file. If there's no readme file, configure space minus minus help will tell you some of the configure options, things like that. This is another one called mother, which is a bioinformatics code. One thing nice about this is that when you do a search on it, it already has some pre-compiled binaries. So I found mother.sen underscore 64.zip. Maybe that doesn't tell you guys anything. That tells me a lot because the CEN is CentOS. Now, before we were on Gen 2, this may or may not work under Gen 2 because it's compiled under CentOS. The 64 is 64 bit. So before we had to actually compile this from source code, which means a .tar.gzip file, they also had a Mac and Windows version. So they do the right things in trying to distribute pre-compiled versions of the software. If you get that, that's awesome because the compilation's been done for you. All you have to do is uncompress it and use it. Most of the time, you have to compile it from source code. And while they do a lot of good things with the pre-compiled stuff, they didn't have a readme file or any documentation that I could see, so I had to get on the internet, and it just said uh, to edit the make file. So once I saw that, it wasn't too difficult, but a simple readme file would have been nice. So that's kind of the basics of, of installing software. Um, again, we hope that you will try it first, but you also need to know when to stop beating your head against the wall. We want you to do a little of that, but if your head starts hurting, that's when to send us email and saying, you know, either, uh, is this something that you think uh, would be good for other people so we can make a module out of it? Or is this something, you know, you, can you help me? Or do I need enough help that I should come in and see Dave? You know, things like that. But definitely, if you try first, then we respect you and then you can come in. So we, do, we don't want you just saying, here's my code, compile it for me. So yes. Okay. Yeah. I was able to install the software. I built a database in that software. Okay. And I reached out to the developer locker. Say try yourself. Yeah. So try yourself first, and if you run into problems, it, depending on the problem, you can either reach out to the the developer or you can talk to us and see if we can give you advice. But in some cases, we may have, if it's building the database, we may have to refer you to the developer itself. So, but yeah, if you run into problems, always touch base with us at least. So. Okay, so that's everything I had prepared. Are there any more questions? So if you want to add any modules to the module list, I mean, it's like if it's used by anybody else. Yeah, then email us. Um, there are modules out there, in fact, uh, there's, I think Mother is one of the modules that's not built yet. Mm -hmm. uh, no one's requested it, and because it was so hard for me to build, we haven't attempted it. But there are other modules that are commonly used that we just haven't done yet, and we probably won't until someone asks us. So I know, especially for the bioinformatics people, there's just a ton of them out there. And we'll, you know, this is, yeah. Yeah, so definitely if, if it's a fairly commonly used one, touch base with us. We do have these easy build stuff where some of the configuration is already set up. And you know we don't want everyone to redo the same thing. So and if I try to install any code from Anaconda. 
Anaconda is in a module. Um, I X a module if I try to install through it. Yeah. So from install through it, so it says the, the following, uh, it doesn't appear that you don't have permission to install the packages, so we need to go to the environment. I'm not an anaconda expert, so why don't we, well, why don't we answer this afterwards, so. Yeah, yep. So, on consumer grade CPUs, usually the, uh, each core supports more than one thread, so I just wanted to know your Haswell and the newer ones, uh, does each core support multiple threads, or is it each core has a single thread? Because sometimes some software allows you to uh, so, run, multiple, run it on multiple threads. But do you mean multiple GPUs at the same time? Or what I mean here is okay. So technically, so, have multi threading, but we turn them off for hyper. You're talking hyper threading. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so just to repeat the question for everyone on Zoom, uh, the question was about hyper-threading. We and almost every other supercomputing center turn hyper-threading off. That means for each core, you're running one process on that core. Hyper-threading can be faster in certain circumstances because if you're doing memory accesses, then, well, one thread is waiting for a memory access, the other thread can be doing work. But uh, that messes some other things up in the supercomputing environments. The, the reason for that is um, how multi, how hyper threading works is really nice for a lot of processes when you're doing memory interactions. But if you're needing to do calculations, they share a single uh, a re, a re, a arithmetic unit. And so you would have to pump all through that same arithmetic unit, and that's where the problem is. And so having a single core running on that one unit is faster in this situation. Okay, any other questions? One more. So um, if you want to load a very large amount of data into memory, just for some reason, for example, if it's uh, an index or something that you want to search through, uh, how do you propose loading that stuff into memory? So uh, probably using a RAM disk would be good. So then you just use a copy to the RAM disk. And then you can control things by, again, asking for the amount of memory that you need, and then you use dev SHM as your RAM disk. And then it's just a copy up, and then it's sitting in memory, and you'll get the fastest access that way. So that's at least off the top of my head. So. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. So I think we had a pretty good turnout between the people who came here and. Uh, I think on uh, Monday, at least, we had about 50 people on Zoom. So we actually had a good turnout there, too. So thank you.